All right, let's get started. I am working from home, so I only have uh, you three here that I'll be talking to. I'm uh, quarantined this week. I'll be back at school on Friday. So today's activity is actually keeping it kind of easy. We got vocab matching and uh, I brought back the good old online textbook questions, but there's only 14 of them. So let's get started on our notes. Remember, let's keep it short and simple, five day words. We have a big topic. We're gonna spend the whole week on this topic. The early Cold War is our topic. The Cold War begins after World War II and it lasts from 1946 until 1991. So we're talking about 45 years. We are in a Cold War, the United States versus the Soviet Union and their communist friends. So when World War II ends, the Soviet Union becomes our enemy. Let's get started. So we are gonna enter a competition. We're the two superpowers after World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union. We emerge as the superpowers. All right, so we're going to look at the Cold War. It's an arms race. And what are we trying to build? Well, remember, if you remember at the end of last week's lesson, we had developed the atomic bomb. So there's a race to build as many atomic bombs as possible between us and the Soviets. And we use our atomic weapons to keep one another in check. We form some Cold War military alliances. The one that the United States forms is called NATO. It's with our European allies, and it means North Atlantic Treaty Organization. CETO, we form in Southeast Asia. And the Soviets and their communist satellite countries form their own alliance called the Warsaw Pact. Now, because the Soviet Union is a communist state, and the United States has a history of uh, being terribly afraid of communism, we enter another second red scare. We're gonna get involved in a military conflict in Korea to stop the spread of communism. We're gonna look at our second Cold War president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, he's president after Harry Truman. And we'll look at American fears surrounding nuclear holocaust. Let's jump into our notes. This map is incredibly important. It explains the Cold War. This is essentially what Europe looked like after World War II ends. The Nazi empire has been defeated. The Soviet Union, which is red, had conquered Eastern Europe. And America and Britain had conquered Western Europe, France, Belgium, Netherlands, West Germany, Italy. The Soviet Union refuses to give these red countries Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. They refuse to allow them to have free elections. And instead, they establish communist governments. So they had actually broken a promise to us. Stalin broke his promise to allow these countries to have free elections. And from this point onwards, the Soviet Union becomes our enemy. So Western Europe is blue and they're all gonna be democracies supported by the United States. Eastern Europe is red and those are communist states supported by the Soviet Union. And it's still being led by Joseph Stalin. Of course, he'll pass away in the middle, in the mid 1950s. But uh, at the beginning of the Cold War, the first 10 years, he is the dictator of the Soviet Union. Okay, so the Cold War is a polit political and military struggle for global power. The Soviets want communism to spread around the globe. The United States wants democracy and capitalism to spread around the globe. 
very important. So the United States with our Western European allies form a military alliance for protection from communist aggression. It's called NATO. It's an American led European military alliance, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Of course, the, the strongest member is the United States. So all these European countries are gonna protect each other with, and the United States is going to help defend them if they were to be attacked by the communists. Now, the Soviet Union responds and the satellite states of Eastern Europe meet in Warsaw, Poland, and they form a military alliance known as the Warsaw Pact. So it's called the Warsaw Pact because Warsaw is in Poland and that was a communist state supported by the Soviet Union. This is a military alliance that's created in response to NATO. So we have two military alliances. So if there were to be a World War III, it would be between NATO and Warsaw Pact. So Europe's gonna be heavily militarized during the Cold War in case of an attack. There's lots of American military bases that are built up in Western Europe, Italy, Germany, in case of a Soviet attack. All right. American foreign policy for the next 45 years is known as containment. We are really used to containment. I'm being contained right now at home. We wanted to quarantine communism. We did not want communism to spread and infect the whole world. Stalin wants to infect the whole world with communism. We don't want communism to spread all over the world and destroy communism, I mean, democracy and capitalism, you know, destroy free trade. So our policy is called containment. We're gonna contain communism where it is. So we're gonna use that word a lot in class. When we talk about the Korean War, when we talk about the Vietnam War, when we talk about what we do in South America and Central America, it's all about containing the threat and spread of communism. So our goal is to spread democracy. The Soviet's goal is to spread communism. Remember, communism is the exact opposite of our form of economic system and government. We had communism as a vocab term last week, two weeks ago. Remember, there's only one political party in a communist state. They control the economy. They control, they own all property. You can't own property in a communist state. There's no religion. All right, we're gonna practice containment First place that we're gonna practice containment is in Greece and Turkey. And this is gonna be President Truman using the containment policy to provide military and financial aid to countries fighting communist insurgents. So it's called the Truman Doctrine. We're gonna provide military and financial aid to countries all over the world to help them fight off the threat of uh, communist insurgents or communist groups wanting to establish communist governments. Greece and Turkey after World War II need help with uh, suppressing communist groups in their countries. So the United States provides military and financial aid. Now the Soviet Union was doing the exact same thing. They were financing communist groups in other countries, hoping to overthrow their governments. So Truman's our president. Remember, he's our president when FDR dies, and he's the one who decides to use the atomic bombs on Japan. He's our first Cold War president. Now, to help Europe, World War II has devastated Europe. Most of the cities have been destroyed by bombs. 
aerial bombings, uh, street to street combat. Uh, there's a lot of people homeless. There's a lot of people starving. The industries have been destroyed. So the United States decides to invest and supply foreign aid to Western Europe to help rebuild their economies. The Marshall Plan is a huge success. Western Europe is rebuilt. They do not turn towards communism. They become our allies and they become strong democracies. And this also boosts the American economy because our industry and financial system is helping rebuild Europe. So the 1950s following World War II is a very prosperous time for the United States, 1950s and 1960s. It's all thanks to uh, George C. Marshall, who was one of our uh, Army uh, Chief Staff, Chief of Staff for Truman, who came up with the idea, so it's named after him. And I have this really great map for us to look at here in a minute. We can see which countries received American aid through the Marshall Plan, $12 billion in economic aid. So you can see our two strongest allies, United Kingdom, that's Britain. So we fought side by side with Britain in World War II. They receive a lot of financial aid. France receives a lot of financial aid, Italy, Greece, Austria, West Germany. We occupied West Germany. They receive aid from us, Netherlands and Belgium. You'll see that no countries in Eastern Europe received American financial aid because they were all communist states, including East Germany, which the Soviet Union controlled. So this is where the money went. These are going to be some of our strongest allies. Most of these countries are in NATO. So it's really important for America to have allies overseas who support us and trade with us, and share ideas, political beliefs, economic beliefs. The first challenge to Truman's containment policy is when Joseph Stalin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to this map real fast and I'll come back to this definition. Here's the conundrum after World War II. Germany is divided into zones to be rebuilt by the allies. The Soviet zone in the east has the capital of Germany in it. The capital of Germany is Berlin. But Berlin has also been divided into zones to be rebuilt. So there's an American zone inside of Berlin. And Berlin is completely in the Soviet zone. So Joseph Stalin decides to cut off all the roads and railroads into Berlin to try to starve out the American zone. But Truman refuses to allow Stalin to take Western Berlin by blockade. And so in order to keep the city, our part of the city supplied, we fly in supplies. So if we can't get there on the ground, we decide to use airplanes to bring supplies into Western Berlin. So we feed Western Berlin by airplane for almost a year. Stalin can't shoot the airplanes down because that would start World War III and he doesn't have an atomic bomb yet. He's developing the atomic bomb, but he doesn't have one yet and we do. So he knows if he goes to war with us, he can't win because we would be able to destroy his armies with our atomic bombs. So Stalin realizes that we're just gonna keep flying in supplies and he gives up the blockade. This is called the Berlin Airlift and it's America's first Cold War victory. A year after the Berlin Airlift, the Soviets test their first atomic bomb.
when the Soviets decide to build a wall through Berlin. And it's called the Berlin Wall. So Berlin will be divided by a physical barrier for most of the Cold War. So when the Cold War ends, I remember this because I was uh, nine years old, I think. In 1991, I remember seeing on the news the Berlin Wall being destroyed when the Cold War ended. When the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, East and West Berlin are united and they tear down the Berlin Wall. I remember seeing that on the news. Okay, so that's the Berlin Airlift. So just remember, Soviet Union becomes our enemy. They're communists. Remember, this map is very important. Back home in the United States, there's another Red Scare. The second Red Scare is even worse than the first Red Scare. This dominates America's public attention for almost 40 years, 45 years. The fear of a uh, Soviet invasion, the fear of Soviet communist spies working in the government, the fear of atomic warfare, and what really sparks the second Red Scare is when the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb in 1949. We watched some atomic bomb videos last week. So they have these incredibly powerful weapons now, but Americans didn't think that the Soviets would be able to get the atomic bomb that quickly. It took us, it took us you know, three or four years with tons of financial backing uh, re secret research laboratories to develop the bomb. And we just didn't think the Soviets had those capabilities. So what ends up happening is we think that communist spies helped give uh, the Soviets our nuclear secrets and that they were working inside of uh, the United States government. So now there's this threat from the inside of communist sympathizers working for the United States government. And it's true, uh, our nuclear secrets, how to develop the atomic bomb, they were secretly stolen by spies and given to the Soviet Union. And that's why they were able to develop an atomic bomb so quickly. So this leads to the second Red Scare, which destroys a lot of people's lives because of this man here, Joseph McCarthy. He takes the public's fears of communism and uses it to gain power. He accuses people in the government without any evidence of being communists. So people become afraid of Joseph, Joseph McCarthy. He's a senator from Wisconsin. He ruins a lot of people's lives as he rises to power in government. We're going to watch a really great video on Joseph McCarthy. Um, Thursday. In the end, people realize that he's full of it. He accuses the army of having the top army generals of being communist spies without any evidence. The public stops listening to him and Congress censors him. Uh, don't, they won't allow him to speak anymore or talk. And he loses uh, his Senate seat. And he dies, I think, uh, in the video, I think he dies at around 48 years old from alcoholism. So he, he had a downfall. But for uh, many, uh, I'd say three or four years, he was very powerful in Congress because he used the public's fears of communism to his advantage. Congress itself creates the House Un-American Activities Committee to investigate Hollywood. So remember back when we talked about the 1920s, we talked about Americans loved movies and Americans were going to the movie theater. How many times did we figure out? Like two or three, four times a week? That's a lot of movies that Americans are watching. And Congress becomes nervous that communist influence in film was going to sway the public to support communism. So they started investigating the writers and the directors and the actors who were making these movies to see if they had any ties to the Communist Party. 
and they were called before this committee and, and kind of, uh, you know, and interviewed and interrogated. And a lot of people were blacklisted from working in Hollywood. Their careers were destroyed. A very dark moment uh, for Hollywood and for Congress. And a lot of, a lot of uh, very famous writers and, and, and movie directors, uh, careers were destroyed by the Red Scare. All right. You do need to know two spies who helped the Soviet Union gain our nuclear secrets that we were talking about a couple slides back. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg uh, were convicted of spying for the U USSR, and they were executed for treason in 1951. It was a very contentious issue because a lot of Americans felt like they were being charged for spying because they were Jewish. And remember, we just gotten out of World War II and European Jewish people had been persecuted and murdered in the Holocaust. And some Americans felt like this was anti-Semitism. But the Rosenbergs uh, were spies. After the Cold War ends, files from the Soviet archive revealed that the Rosenbergs had been working in a spy network and had given over some important nuclear secrets to the communists. All right, our first war of the Cold War, it's kind of a funny way to say it, but our first hot war where there's shooting and killing is in Korea. Now, why was Korea uh, the battle zone the first battle zone of the Cold War. Well, it all occurs because of Japan, actually. Japan had occupied Korea. And when Japan's defeated in World War II, Korea's given its independence. The only problem is it's not created as one country. Two Koreas are created. North Korea, which will be a communist country, and South Korea, which will be non-communist. Now, North Korea has a really powerful neighbor, China. And China had just become a communist country. And North Korea, with China's uh, approval, invades South Korea. The United States and the United Nations intervene. So we want to contain the spread of communism. We don't want communism to spread. So we intervene with our military. So when we were afraid of communism spreading, it's known as the domino theory. So they said, well, if South Korea falls to communism, well, it could be Japan next, or it could be you know, Thailand or Malaysia or Vietnam. So we intervene with our military and we fight North Korea. And then we end up fighting the Chinese army. And we fight for three years and it ends in a stalemate in 1953, well, actually, it doesn't ever end. It's still ongoing. It ends with a ceasefire in 1953. So technically, the war has never ended. 54,000 Americans are killed in this war. Maybe you've heard of that TV show, MASH. That was about a, a medical group uh, in Korea, uh, an American medical group from the American army. Uh, this war is sometimes also referred to as the Forgotten War. And uh, I'm going to show you this map that shows how the war progressed. It starts from left to right. So on the left, North Korea invades South Korea. North Korea is yellow, South Korea is green. And you'll notice that South Korea is almost defeated. They pushed all the way back to Pusan. But then you'll notice in the second map, the United States arrives. The UN, but it's mostly American forces. We arrive and we push back North Korea and you'll see that North Korea is almost defeated. And we push North Korea all the way back to the Yalu River, which is the boundary between China and North Korea. And then the Chinese army attacks us. And we get in the third map, you'll see that we get pushed back below Seoul. 
And then for the next year or two, we fight around Seoul. And on the map on the right is how Korea looks today. There's an armistice line. And along that line is known as the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. And on both sides of the DMZ, there are huge armies facing each other. Because remember, the war technically has never ended. So if you can't cross the line, you'll get killed. And you'll also notice that the capital of South Korea, Seoul, is really close to North Korea. The North Koreans have tons of artillery pointing at Seoul. So if there were ever to be in the war were to ever resume, Seoul would be bombed. And also North Korea has uh, developed atomic weapons. So it's a sticky part of the world for American foreign policy. All right, let's switch it up. Truman's after Truman, we have uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower becomes president. Dwight D. Eisenhower was a vocab term last week. He was a supreme allied commander of our forces in Europe. He was in charge of D-Day. Uh, incredibly popular president. Very, very, very popular president. He serves two terms from 1953 to 1961. He has some Cold War policies. One is called brinkmanship. Uh, the willingness to go to the brink of war to stop the spread of communism. Dwight D. Eisenhower rapidly builds up our nuclear weapons arsenal. He also believed that if the USSR stopped trying to spread, that we could live a peaceful coexistence with them. That if both sides didn't try to intervene in the world, we could live together in peace. He also feared our the United States military industrial complex. He thought since World War II, our military industries, our factories and companies that made military equipment had gotten too powerful and could sway the country into future wars in order to supply military equipment. So when he left office, he warned the country of the military industrial complex. And our last set of vocab terms for today. There's a lot of them. I'm going to tell you the ones that are most important, but I'll take you through all of them. Throughout the 1950s, there are a lot of atomic bomb tests. And they release it releases a lot of radiation into the atmosphere. So a lot the most powerful countries in the world agree to ban atomic bomb testing. In the United States, the civil defense is created. It's a non-military effort to prepare Americans for a communist attack. Americans build fallout shelters. I'll show you a picture of one here in a minute. They were underground bunkers for protection from atomic attack. Fallout shelters and Sputnik are your two most important vocab terms here. So the Soviets launched Sputnik. It's the first satellite to orbit, orbit the Earth. And it sparks fears in the United States that we've fallen behind in the Cold War. It leads to a lot more spending in education, uh, especially math and science, to improve our uh, workforce. And this Sputnik also leads to the space race, which culminates. So Sputnik's launched in 1957. And it leads to the space race. And in 1969, the United States wins the space race by landing humans on the moon. So 12 years later, we land on the moon. And there was also a belief of mutual assured destruction. It was a concept also known as MAD. If World War III occurred, both sides would be destroyed because they'd use nuclear weapons and that would destroy themselves and the earth. So, you know, 100 or 200 atomic bombs blow up on cities. Uh, massive amounts of radiation would be released into the atmosphere and a lot of dirt and debris would be lifted into the atmosphere and it would block out the sun and it would lead to something called a nuclear winter where the earth would get very cold and you wouldn't be able to grow plants all the trees and life on Earth would die. So we don't ever want to have a nuclear, a nuclear war. 
here's a fallout shelter. So if there's a nuclear war, I mean, maybe if it was a small one, you would want to live on, but if it was a massive nuclear war and you have a nuclear winter, I don't really see the point of staying down in a fallout shelter because the earth, would, you wouldn't be able to live on the earth. Eventually these people would run out of food and water and they would die. But if it was just a small isolated nuclear attack, you would stay down in your fallout shelter and then you could come out and uh, maybe help rebuild society. These were the fallout shelters people were building in their backyards. That's your vocab.